the explanation as to why at the higher emergent level that certain things occur is really the explanation. It is not the fact that certain things were determined to have happened because the Big Bang happened and the laws of motion acted upon particles over time and caused them to appear where they appeared today. That is not an explanation. That is an in principle, you would be able to describe the motion of those particles and where they end up today. And so this is why the fabric of reality, Winston Churchill, copper atom story is just so deeply profound. And I think escapes sometimes the uh, escapes discussions on this topic. Let's just recap that. And you can you can fast forward the next five or 10 minutes as I go through this yet again. But but let me try and refine it in a certain way. The, the, the situation is this. There is a statue in Parliament Square in London of Winston Churchill. And the tip of that statue is a copper atom. Why is the copper atom there? Now, on the one hand, you can say that well, the copper atom is there for the same reason that any atom is anywhere right now. And any atom is anywhere right now because 13.7 billion years in the past, approximately, the Big Bang occurred and all of matter and space and energy exploded out from that point. And eventually some of it, over millions of years, coalesced into stars, the first generation of stars. At the end of their lives, some of them exploded in supernova, supernovae, explosions, and scattered their contents across a wide region of space. And some of those atoms, due to astrophysical processes, were copper atoms. Those copper atoms then coalesced, mixing with the hydrogen, helium, and the intergalactic space. And some of them formed new stars. And some of them formed planets as well, like the Earth. And so the Earth formed out of this previously exploded star or stars and contains copper. And the copper atom, again, under the forces of nature, under gravity and electromagnetism and so on and so forth, weathering and erosion, ended up in uh, a certain place where it was quarried and the forces of nature eventually caused it to end up at the tip of Winston Churchill's nose. Um, and that's why that copper atom is there, due to deterministic physical laws. That's not an explanation. That's a general purpose statement about any particular bit of matter anywhere in the entire universe. And when people try to invoke this to explain away something like free will, for example, and try to say it couldn't have been a free choice because you were determined to do what you were determined to do because at the Big Bang, the laws of physics that were there are still acting right now and you have to obey these deterministic laws in the same way that the copper atom had to obey a deterministic law to end up where it did. It completely misses the point about what an explanation truly is. Free will is not an attempt to get outside of the laws of physics. And it's an attempt to explain what is really going on in the context of a deterministic universe. In the context of a deterministic universe, we have species arising that didn't arise before. But no biologist should be tempted to say, well, there's no such thing as evolution by natural selection. Evolution by natural selection doesn't really create new species. All that's happening is atoms are following deterministic laws of physics. That would be ridiculous. And I don't think any physicist makes this point. I don't think any scientist, no biologist makes this point. What they say is the explanation of the origin of species is evolution by natural selection. It's this emergent concept that these things called species exist, this thing called selection exists, and that niches are filled, or niches, as some people say, by organisms that are fittest in that particular environment. And if the environment changes, the genes are selected against, and the species can sometimes go extinct, to be filled by new species with genes that are fitter for that particular environment. That's an explanation. It's an emergent explanation. But all, and all of those things are real. They're really happening. Selection is really happening. Adaptation is really happening. Niches really exist and species really exist and fill those niches. Now, in precisely the same way, 
all we have to say is that the reason why, for example, the copper atom is at the tip of Winston Churchill's nose, the explanation of that is that there was a war called the Second World War involving two sides of great powers, dominant among them the United Kingdom and Germany, the leaders of whom were Adolf Hitler and Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill eventually won the war for his side. And so we like to, out of respect, remember great heroes who saved civilization, one of whom was Winston Churchill, and as whom we learned recently, uh, Karl Popper thought was a great epistemologist. Uh, I'll go back to a previous episode for that one. Um, Winston Churchill is... His statue is there with a copper atom at its nose because we make statues out of bronze so that they don't weather away quite so quickly. But someone chose to build that statue, chose to design it in that way. In fact, groups of people came to that decision and freely chose to do so. And trying to eliminate choice and freedom out of that whole picture is to break what would otherwise be a good explanation. Because we try and say it's merely determined by physical laws, deterministic laws, then we've missed the entire point of trying to explain what's going on in the real world. This reductionist uh, conception of how it is that reality evolves over time is simply, it's not false, but it simply misses the point. It's true vacuously. We can always say that anything that happens was determined to happen. It doesn't get us very far. Um, in denying the supernatural, we don't have to embrace pure reductionist physicalism. We can take another avenue where we say, yes, of course, physics is fundamentally true. It's correct as a description of reality. But it doesn't explain everything that's going on. And besides, the strange thing is that for someone who says they could, in principle, in principle, predict what a person is going to do next, or predict what is going to happen next, if they had a full description of the laws of physics and the initial conditions, is doing nothing, in my opinion, but invoking the supernatural. Because what is this thing that is able to actually do that predicting? Well, an oracle with the full knowledge of the laws of physics. Well, this oracle is basically the omniscient theistic God, the God that knows everything that's going to happen, the God that created the universe and knows everything that's going to happen. So it is a, an appeal to the supernatural. Now, someone might say, oh, no, well, we don't need that. Maybe we can just have a supercomputer of the future. I doubt it. Um, this supercomputer of the future would have to calculate all of the different alternatives that could possibly happen in countless numbers of universes. And it would have to know with perfect precision what the initial conditions are at any particular given time so that it can make this deterministic prediction. But we know from physics you cannot have a perfect understanding of the conditions at any particular time. For all the atoms in the universe, we're going to have a perfect understanding of where exactly they are. We know that's not possible, given the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, among other things. But we know that we can't have this complete knowledge simultaneously of every single atom in the entire universe. Relativity, for another reason. So this idea that we could in principle, in principle have this predictive mechanism that would allow us to determine exactly what's going to happen next is itself an appeal to the supernatural. The device required in order to do this would be magical. It would have to have all the qualities that an omniscient creator of the universe would have. And so this is why I reject this idea that, in principle, the idea that we could, um, with full knowledge of the laws of physics and full knowledge of the initial conditions, predict what's going to happen next, therefore you don't have free will, I think is false. Because I don't think such an in principle um, argument has any bearing on the reality of free will when in practice it will never be possible. It will never be possible because no such device can do such a measurement 
of all the particles in the entire universe. It would have to be a god of some sort. Okay, that takes me far away from anything to do with this chapter again. 